Fire Adapted Colorado. I feel really fortunate to be up here with the group that I'm with today and to get to introduce them to talk about workforce development in the restoration industry. Um, this comes up frequently in restoration work, that there's a huge need, um, a lot of workforce challenges. It was really wonderful to hear over the last couple of days, seeing these reciprocal relationships between the people who work on the land and the land that they're stewarding, giving back to one another. And so uh, I just, I guess, challenge you guys as we go through this and, and talk about workforce development to think about how do we not just find the people with the technical skills and the training, but also find the people who are going to be uh, passionate stewards of our working lands into the future. Um, and we'll have you guys sharing uh, what needs do we have and what workforce needs do we have to sustain healthy working lands and working communities, and what actions need to be taken to help our rural communities build their competencies and expertise. Um, so I've got some questions. We're going to run through the, um, go across here and start with Tim Reeder. He's the program specialist with the Wood Products Utilization and Marketing Program with the Colorado State Forest Service. I've known Tim since I started doing any kind of forestry work in Southwest Colorado, um, but I think he was been there uh, probably 20 years before I started that work. So um, nobody knows the industry and workforce needs in the state of Colorado, uh, as well as Tim or Molly who is going to uh, follow up, Tim, with her overview. Molly Pitts is the director of the Colorado Timber Industry Association, has a really good pulse on what's actually happening uh, within the timber industry in the state of Colorado, and is going to be able to speak from, from that side of things and, and maybe a little bit beyond Colorado, too. We'll see. And then Julie Kennery is the program manager for the Rural Engagement and Vitality Center in northeastern Oregon. And so she, uh, she gets a bit beyond the timber side of things and gets to, other, um, gets to deal with other workforce needs in developing our new um, restoration workforce in, uh, in the Northwest. So without further ado, Tim, you wanna give us a little sure. background on the issues? Ah, certainly. Um, first of all, just like to acknowledge the Western Governors Association and the staff for uh, reaching out. Um, I'm from Durango, uh, that's a long reach sometimes, but uh, giving me the opportunity and the invitation to participate in this uh, panel and the workshop itself. Um, as Becca mentioned, I'm, I deliver a program, the Wood Products Utilization Marketing Program with our State Forest Service here in Colorado. Through that program, our forest products industry, logging community, forest products businesses, sawmills, and then our contractors that conduct our hazardous fields treatments. Through our program, they have access to technical assistance, um, even small business assistance. Um, we do offer financial assistance as well to help to support uh, the resilience and sustainability of this business community, this business sector. Um, we do some education and outreach. Uh, one of the challenges in addressing the workforce situation, particularly, is awareness. Our timber industry is relatively small footprint in Colorado, and uh, let's face it, we're not the only ones that face workforce challenges. Um, so raising the awareness uh, of our industry to put them on an equivalent table, I guess, with some of the other larger uh, business sectors in Colorado so that we have, uh, our timber industry is able to access uh, the programs to help support them specifically towards training, uh, recruitment um, of employees. Um, we do some research related to forest products here in Colorado. Uh, currently, we're emphasizing harvesting and treatment costs across the state and what we can do to begin to decrease the escalation of those costs in some areas of the state, particularly on the front range. Um, and we're excited with a new initiative. Um, we're going to produce a statewide biomass assessment in the coming months. Um, I think that this effort will do a great deal to inform on the variety of challenges our timber industry faces, but also 
provide the workforce will be a big component of that assessment when we uh, move forward with it. Um, we do some training as well. Um, next month, and with some partners we have with uh, my colleagues in New Mexico and Arizona, we'll be hosting a dry kiln operators training. It's online, virtual. Um, it's a companion to an in-person wood utilization workshop we'll be holding in Albuquerque. We're also doing an online financial assistance workshop, which is probably more significant today than ever. You know, the wealth of resources that are becoming available to address economic development and workforce issues, um, maybe at its greatest point now. And so we're offering this workshop in financial assistance to help give participants some guidance on how to access that assistance. Um, in many cases, that assistance is competitive. Um, so we're going to try to do the best we can to, um, again, provide some guidance, how to access the traditional programs and some of the newer ones related to the stimulus efforts that are coming through the states. Um, I can tell you, you know, anecdotally, it's just a pretty good example. One of our sawmill clients, I mean, they physically shut down their phones because they cannot take any new orders. The demand for their product is there, but they do not have the employees to produce the product, get it out the door, and result in cash flow. Um, and that's, you know, I hear that not just at this one sawmill. Um, I'm spending a great deal of my time looking at workforce issues, educating myself on the programs that are out there at the local, state, and federal level, and hopefully providing a conduit to help facilitate those resources. Um, a number of our mills have applied for training grants through our Office of Economic Development. Um, so when they are successful at recruiting and hiring new employees, um, we're able to offer them some cost savings in actually training those employees so that they will uh, be more productive and uh, hopefully uh, you know, continue in their work with the, uh, the appropriate facility there. Um, you know, we're trying to see where, this is probably my final comment, we're trying to see where our industry may fit. In Colorado, we're transitioning from some of our coal extraction and coal power economies. Uh, our Office of Just Transition is somebody that I've been talking with, Molly as well, and we're exploring whether our timber industry, our small sawmills and logging businesses in these communities that will face a workforce transitioning, whether our industry can help solve their problem uh, by providing a landing spot for some of these employees as they transition away. And um, I'm aware of a couple of our sawmill clients that have hired people from the previous coal extraction and power industries. So um, we think there's some opportunity to help address our workforce issues. Um, in that manner as well. I'll turn it over to you, Molly. Thanks, Tim. <clears throat> Thanks, Tim. And good morning. My name is Molly Pitts, and I serve as the executive director for the Colorado Timber Industry Association. And like others this morning, I want to thank the Western governors for bringing this topic forward. Um, this is super important. So the Colorado Timber Industry Association has been around for quite a long time. Um, we're made up of small family-owned businesses that are involved in logging, manufacturing, and service work here in Colorado. Um, in short, I'd like to say we're the, the voice for the timber industry here in Colorado. And we do a variety of things, um, including we have a big emphasis on safety, um, continuing education, best management practices, and public education. And within my job, I, I do a fair amount of reading NEPA, although I'm never going to claim to be a NEPA geek. <laughs> and, um, but I work to make sure the businesses have a, a good supply of wood and can operate. And there's challenges when um, I can get them wood, but there's nobody to actually cut that wood. Um, a colleague of mine um, and I let a couple weeks ago, we traveled throughout Colorado meeting with our members, and there wasn't one of my members that didn't say, I'm full up. I don't need any additional staff. 
Um, one of our businesses down um, in the Cortez Mancos area normally has a crew of 30. On the day we were there, 11 of his employees had not showed up for work. And that was pretty normal. Um, and so it's pretty hard to run a business and grow a business when you don't have employees. And I didn't have an answer for him on how to fix it because every other business that we had visited with was struggling with those same issues, both on the logging side and the manufacturing side. And, and partly, I think for a long time, we've encouraged our young children and our you know, graduates, go to college, study medicine or some of those others, but stay away from the trades. And we've kind of blackballed the trades for so long that getting folks interested is really hard. Um, and so Tim and I um, were both involved with the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative, and we co-chair the Workforce Capacity Subcommittee. And so through that initiative, we've taken um, kind of a deeper dive into workforce development. Partly for me, I'm a forester by trade, and so I had to learn about what existing workforce development programs mm -hmm. exist in the state. And there is a lot. Mm -hmm. What I did find, though, is that most of them know little to nothing about our industry. And so while there's folks that want to help, we have to start at the very bottom and educate them about our industry. And what does it take to be a logger or to work in the mill? And so we're doing some really good work, but we have a long way to go. And just recognizing us as an industry is part of that first step. Now, I am very pleased. Um, the Colorado State Legislature really stepped up last year and passed um, several different forestry bills to get more work done. It, I will say it helps when you have the three largest wildfires in Colorado history. Um, it encouraged a lot of folks to learn more about what's happening in our forests here and what needed to be done. But part of the problem is, is just throwing money at the problem doesn't solve the issue, especially when we don't have folks to get the work done. And so we are, Tim and I, are, we're exploring a lot of avenues. We're having lots of conversations. But it's going to take a statewide effort to fix this problem. And so I'm, I'm excited to learn more about maybe what's happening in the Pacific Northwest and um, figure out how we can help solve the issue here. I will say there, there's good examples out there. Um, we've heard from a program in Maine. They have a 12-week summer program that takes folks with little to no education. And after 12 weeks, they're ready to operate equipment. They know how to read maps. They can read a prescription. And while they're not super proficient, they're better than where they were when they started the program. But that program wasn't cheap. And it took in, um, investment at the state level to get that going. We've also explored um, the Shasta Community College in California has a year-long program. But again, they had heavy investment at the state level to purchase equipment. I'm sure most of you know this, but I like to always throw it out. Logging equipment costs anywhere between a quarter and a half million dollars for one piece of equipment. And you need at least four or five to actually operate and, and, and get a tree cut processed and on a truck. Um, and speaking of trucks, um, truck driving is huge, it's, it's a huge issue. We don't have enough, and pretty much if you talk to anybody who needs a truck to get a, a product from production delivered to the customers, it's a huge issue. And we, and, you know, I think COVID highlighted some of that, uh, but it continues to be a, a problem. So we have to look at this as a larger issue and figure out how to get work done. With that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm Julie Kennery, and I'm the program manager for the Rural Engagement and Vitality Center. And we're a new program, and you know, listening to the other panelists, 
we certainly have the same kinds of issues happening in Eastern Oregon and across the state. Um, I'm, I'm gonna share today some of the things that are happening in Eastern Oregon. They don't resolve all of the issues, but we're um, all working together. So um, the story that I wanna focus on today is really the theme that I keep hearing coming up in every panel. It's collaboration and how important it is that we have so many different people from different, different backgrounds and different parts of this industry and the story to come together and solve these complex problems. Just the right arrow. Just the <laughs> ah, okay, thank you. Um, so just a quick introduction here to um, how this program that I'm running was formed. Um, and where we fit into kind of the big picture of forestry and restoration efforts. So we're the, um, we came together because of a partnership, which is rather unique, I think, between a regional public university and a successful community-based nonprofit. Um, Wallawa Resources is, um, has been around for 25 years. They've been focused on the stewardship of rural communities and their economies and the land, as many of you have talked about um, during these last two days. Um, on the map there, um, these partners are located. It's about an hour drive between those two spots. And within that circle, there are three national forests. So that's kind of the background of where, where I live. Um, the mission of the REV is to create partnerships between Eastern Oregon University and communities and organizations in the region to enhance the vitality of the region and develop tomorrow's rural workforce and leaders. So one of our primary goals in that is to connect students at EOU to future employment opportunities in Eastern Oregon. And another primary goal is to build the collaborative capacity in the region and to help resolve these complex issues that are faced by rural communities. So um, to you know, meet this or to look at the development of tomorrow's workforce um, and leaders, we do this in typical ways that um, you've all heard of doing things like internships or class projects with community partners, as well as through programming that um, begins before college and builds awareness of careers that students might be into. And this is um, particularly often in natural resources because of where we're located. So just to illustrate the impact that these kind of things can have, um, I just wanted to share a quote from one of our student interns um, my internship with the REV has given me a greater understanding and appreciation for forestry and agricultural based industries in rural Oregon communities and the impacts that sustainable forest practices and holistic economic development have on those communities well being. It has influenced me to focus on rural economic development as a career. So the student is part of a program where we're uh, developing socioeconomic profiles related to force management. So um, for the next few slides, I, I want to focus on um, this collaborative effort that's happening in our region related to the topic of this workshop. Um, this regional partnership received funding through the CFLRP this year. So the area that's shown on this map is um, approximately 10 million acres. The partnership called the Northern Blues All Lands Forest Restoration Partnership was created to um, support the implementation of almost a million acres of forest restoration and wildfire risk management on national forests, um, tribal lands, as well as family forest land across 13 counties in Oregon and Washington. So the CFLRP represents a huge opportunity for the region, but also a huge need for the workforce to um, complete that work. 
and Willowa Resources is in place, and now the REV too as a program under Willowa Resources is in place to, to help fill that, that need. So the diagram that you're looking at right here, it shows the organizational structure of the partnership. Um, and I just wanna share this because it illustrates the collaborative nature of a network that includes many independent partners. And to walk you through this really quickly, um, at the top in green, there are place-based project teams. So these are located in different regions of the area. Um, they're working across a really large landscape to coordinate and actually implement projects. The resource teams in blue are purpose-based and provide support across the whole region. And then the leadership team in yellow is made up from the primary partner organizations who own or manage forest lands in the Northern Blues. So the, the circled box in red there is where you'll see the REV along with another partnership called the BIC. And we're um, helping to provide the stewardship workforce training and forest product utilization. And so this is just to give you a sense of, of that collaborative effort that's happening. And um, what we're looking at here are just some of the organizations who've come together to lead this work. The examples I'm gonna share next are programs that, that will be relied upon to help meet some of the workforce demands that are coming. Um, it's just a few examples, it's not everything, and I know there's more. I know I'm learning a lot more ideas from being here, so I'm really, really happy that I could come here and be part of this. So I've divided um, the workforce programs into three different categories. And this first one here is supporting entrepreneurs and small business. Uh, on this slide, there are two examples that have um, been put together by Wallawa Resources. The first example there shows the impact that five women can have on 60,000 acres of pri for private forested lands. So there was a shortage of forest consultants they needed uh, management plans um, for these private landowners, and there weren't enough people to do that work. So um, we put together a training program that um, allowed us to, to have that work happen. Um, the second example on here is Heartwood Biomass. So this is a long story. It took about 20 years to come to where it is today. Um, this mill, would have been closed down years ago had um, Wallawa Resources and other investment investors in Wallawa County not come together to um, turn it into a working sawmill again. Um, so this is one where, you know, an example of utilizing biomass, providing a place for that small diameter timber to be processed and also employing people in the county. And um, I'll also mention that Community Solutions, Inc. is a for-profit subsidiary of Willow Resources. So Willow Resources is a nonprofit, um, and they also have a for-profit subsidiary to be able to do things like this. So the second category is about working with the colleges and universities. Um, the students, the graduates, the faculty, um, getting those resources out into our rural communities. So Willowa Resources has a long tradition and commitment to, um, to education. That's part of what they've been doing all these years. Um, the REV as a program helps increase their capacity to do this and um, connects them more regionally to other resources such as um, Eastern Oregon University. So in the examples here, we've got um, new monitoring crews that are gonna be trained each summer. They'll be monitoring the restoration work for the CFLRP. Um, those students are building skills that are in demand by local employers. Uh, the other example we have there is the one that I mentioned earlier where we are working, working with a, 
another collaborative group um, called the BIC. That's the Blues Intergovernmental Council. And that group is um, working with Forest Service. So it's uh, Eastern Oregon and Southeast Washington counties um, coming together with agency uh, professionals, looking at how can they together come up with a forest plan that will support these communities and meet the needs of those forests. So one of the questions that they had is, um, what are the socioeconomic impacts on these communities? And so we're working with economics faculty at EOU and student researchers to um, produce uh, reports for 14 counties in the Blue Mountain region. This last area here is um, working with the younger generation, so with high school students and connecting them to these career opportunities. So a couple of these examples here are inter summer internship programs where students are going out, they're actually learning either monitoring skills or restoration skills. So they're in that middle picture, you can see um, students in Baker County who were standing there with the landowner, this was last summer, and they were doing work with them, it was paid for by the landowner to accomplish things that they needed done on their property. So just to close, just coming back to this theme of collaboration, it, this work just cannot happen without all these different kinds of partners coming together. And um, so I think especially in rural areas where our resources can be so geographically dispersed, um, we really need to be able to um, you know, have work being implemented by local people, um, at, but also to know about that work and to value it and put it all together, as uh, someone said yesterday, in our stone soup. You know, I think it really is we, we all come together to um, solve this problem. Thank you, Julie. And thanks, thank you all for giving a little bit more uh, framing and background on some of the things that are happening around the West. That was really nice, really, to have some concrete um, examples of ways that you're directly meeting the local needs. And it's not just the logging and the trucking and the manufacturing, but it's even back to the forest management planning. Um, all the way through to the monitoring that we have. And, and that's just one component of vegetation management, forest restoration, not to mention all of the other working lands, um, workforce needs. If, if you've got a place you gotta get prescribed fire on the ground in or um, you know, mitigate for cultural resources on federal lands and things like that. So um, those are some really nice concrete examples of how you've addressed some of that in Oregon. So I'd like to uh, jump back to Colorado panelists here and uh, see if you have any kind of specific examples of what is happening or something that's happened in the past with workforce training um, helping to feel, fill some of the need that seemed like it worked and maybe replicable. Um, sure, I, I mentioned in my opening remarks the training grants through our Office of Economic Development. Those are relatively simple to, for a business to apply for. Um, as Molly mentioned, it's just bringing that awareness that those resources are available. So a couple of our mills uh, have been successful at bringing on new people. Um, one in Southeast Colorado used these training grants um, to train virtually their entire workforce um, as a new startup. And then our existing mills um, have had the opportunity to utilize those as well. Um, Molly mentioned the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative. That's Colorado-centric, if you will. Um, it's allowed through that subcommittee and the other stakeholders to bring the awareness of, you know, basically this concept of working lands, working communities, to, um, you know, the urban and, you know, influencers, front range policymakers. Um, in my current position with the State Forest Service, I also chair something called the Forest Utilization Network. It's chartered by the Council of Western State Foresters, and basically it's a 
collection of people like me in other states, in the western states. And so I'm, in that role, I'm communicating, communicating with my colleagues across the west almost daily. And one of the things that I will say is success travels well. A lot of what, what I find I try to apply in Colorado is not something I come up with necessarily. Um, I try to look for those successes in other states and bring them to the, to the ground here to meet our challenges. Um, one aspect I think we've had pretty good success with is we're, we want to fill some existing jobs. Those jobs, as Molly mentioned, you know, they're it's hard work, pretty labor intensive. And that may explain why we have a challenge recruiting the next generation of workforce. Um, you know, we have a loan program. We provide financing to our forest products business community that otherwise may not qualify for traditional forms of lending. And through that, you know, they purchased the equipment, as Molly mentioned. Um, they're starting to create new and better jobs at their facilities. Um, and, um, you know, we'll be able to do more of that uh, in the next couple of years. Um, so I think successes are out there. It's just, it's a capacity. We're talking with curriculums, talking to our community colleges about establishing these uh, curriculums. We're uh, exploring logging simulators, trying to get some of those out to rural communities as a that first step towards maybe a sustainable curriculum in timber harvesting or sawmill manufacturing or even the other aspects of a forest restoration workforce. And I'll just add, part of the Rocky Mountain Restoration Initiative, you know, that's based on four core values. Um, and one of them is recreation. And so while Tim and I spent a lot of our career focusing on forest vegetation um, and the workforce for that, we are also exploring other avenues. So through that process, we learned that Trinidad State College has a trail building curriculum. And it's the only one in the state. Um, and I mean, I think COVID showed all of us um, just how much our public lands, um, state lands are being utilized. And if we don't have folks to clean bathrooms and take care of trails, we're having a huge impact, and that's not what we want. And so um, I was really excited to connect with folks from Trinidad State College and learn about their trail building program. And they're actually the ones doing the trail building at Fisher State Park, which is one of the newest state parks here in Colorado. So those students are taking what they learn in the classroom and applying it directly on the ground, building new trails. and. I was very excited to learn that the, it's not just about how to build trails, but also how to maintain them, lay them out in a sustainable manner. You know, what does it take? Because it, it's very much a science. And if we don't build trails correctly, we see the impacts from it. So it's great to know that we are building the next generation of, of trail builders. Um, earlier, I don't remember if it was yesterday or today, but we, we talked about the Civilian Conservation Corps, which I think is could potentially be um, a huge resource in this workforce development. Unfortunately, I think we need to, to do more in terms of a transition program from Civilian Conservation Corps. So a lot of times those students come in, they work for a period of time, and then a lot of them, the majority of them, go back to whatever they had planned on doing before they joined the Civilian Conservation Corps. And there is not a great transition. So to me, it's a, it's a great resource. Like these are folks that have already decided they enjoy spending some time outside, but they're not sure how to go from what they do during the Civilian Conservation Corps to a career. And in visiting with um, folks at the state level here, there's not a great transition program. And so I, I'd love for the Western Governors Association and others who, um, if we do get the level of funding for the Civilian Conservation Corps, to work on that. How do we give them an opportunity to take what they've learned during that time and tr transition it to a career? And, and how do we maybe help them get a certificate or a, you know, levels of accomplishment um, to take with them through that process? So, 
because we, we need to. Um, a lot of the folks that I work with directly, um, while they would love to have students that come with a certificate, they want folks to come with the skills. And, and that's more important sometimes. And so we need to be able to help them get those skills necessary. So I'm just gonna put in a quick plug reminder for folks who are out there in virtual world that if you have questions, you can still email those to askwga at westgov.org. And I know we'll have some more questions here in the room too. Um, I guess I would just, Julie, do you have anything else to, uh, to add on that one? You covered a lot of examples already. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so um, I do wanna, Tim, something that you brought up was the, um, that there's a lot of sharing among the different state wood utilization coordinators across the West, and that you get ideas from each other and, and steal, borrow, beg, what, whatever you do uh, with those. And, um, and so I would like you to maybe express a little bit more about how the workforce demands actually differ in the, across these different landscapes and, um, and strategies on those landscapes. And how do you, so is there anything, you know, how do you take something and change it? for the place um, you know what i've noticed in in taking uh, <laughs> working with some of my colleagues in other states is um you know we're at different levels of infrastructure across the west um colorado may be on the lower scale um relative to some of our other states um but those are you know those primary difference it's just a lot of similarity um there may be some I don't know if historic is the right word, but in many of the Western states, there still resides a knowledge base for the timber industry. Um, you know, even the younger generations can still, in many places in the West, they're still um, presented with sawmills, logging trucks. Um, Colorado, not so much. I mean, the other the other day in Durango, where I work, um, you know, I was having lunch outside at a park i saw four log trucks driving through durango i've, I've never seen four log trucks I, i've been doing this job for 20 years um and I, i'm sure everybody in durango was surprised to see you know log trucks running through our our town um so that you know again goes back to the awareness and appreciation for the timber industry we have um Molly mentioned some of the curriculums that are developed in other states. We're, as she said, we're looking at those. We've had um, virtual presentations, but as Molly said it, you know, uh, one of the other panelists before said, you gotta give a damn, you know, <laughs> at some level, and it's gonna take that next step of investment um, across our state to help. If that's what they wanna see, um, you know, we need to work towards that. It's not going to happen on its own. Um, we have to engage Molly's members, my agency, and even beyond my organization that I work for. And, you know, we're, we're engaging greater with our economic development community. A couple weeks, Molly and I will be uh, discussing these same similar issues at Colorado's annual economic development conference. Um, I believe in another week or so, I'm meeting with the workforce Council of the Western Slope um, out of Delta. So um, it's gonna take that partnership to replicate some of the successes, bring them into Colorado, but the outcomes are, are huge um, for you know addressing workforce capacity and the capacity in general of our you know timber industry and restoration-based economies. And I just want to add, I think one of the most important things um, that we can do is support the industry we have. Um, if, if folks see that the businesses that are already existing aren't supported, it doesn't give them a lot of encouragement to join them. And, and what I mean is, you know, here in Colorado, we rely heavily on federal lands to supply our timber. We do get some off of state and private, and I think we're gonna see that grow. 
But we have to have a, a base supply for our businesses. And when others see businesses close because they don't have adequate supply, why would you invest in that? And that's all the way from infrastructure down to employees. And so you have to support your existing businesses. And then you have to plan accordingly if you want to grow. So um, a couple of people yesterday mentioned the forest restoration and wildfire risk mitigation grant program here in Colorado. Historically, that was funded with severance tax. And so it was very cyclical. You know, some years we'd have a lot of money and some years we'd have not very much money. Last year, Governor Polis put in $6 million and then they made it a permanent line item in the budget at $8 million. That is tremendous. But we went from allocating, I think, $400,000 in previous years to, you know, 14 overnight. And I said, that's great, but I'm worried about who's going to do that work because you can't grow an industry that fast. And so we, we need to work on, you know, in addition to funding the work, funding those who are going to do the work because you got to have both of that. So we got to work on that. Um, and I'm, I'm working with the state legislature already this year to potentially run an internship program. Um, if we don't have, we do have Front Range Community College has an existing um, program and they luckily just got a, a simulator for equipment. But the majority of our workers do on the job training. And so I've, I've talked about an internship program that'll help offset the costs. When you do on-the-job training, you get little to no productivity from those employers, employees for a while. And so it's burdensome for a business to take them on. But if that's the only way we can home grow our employees, we'll do it. Um, but an internship program will help offset those costs. So, um, One other thing that I would add, just if you can picture the diagram that I had up earlier um, describing the Northern Blues All Lands Partnership. Um, the, that blue row, that, those resource teams, you know, in our situation, many of those programs are, are within Wallawa Resources as, you know, a, a community-based nonprofit. But I think in Colorado, those programs exist through multiple other organizations. So kind of networking those resources, which, you know, I'm, sure they already are, but kind of thinking of it in terms of where are all those programs, how can we make sure that they know about this situation and that situation and relate their work to workforce development mm -hmm. can, I think is also helpful. Yeah, and that's tough when, the, you know, the only two people with that knowledge in the state are right here, you know, um, there's another workforce <laughs> bottleneck there in terms of just really having the people at all, all levels mm -hmm. from, from the ground and the people to train all the way to, to the connectors and the people who are developing these programs. Um, I've got one more, but then hopefully you guys have some questions in mind as well. Um, y you guys have talked about a few programs that can be scaled up. Um, with fed but I want you to think more specifically to federal investment um, what approaches for building the local workforce can be scaled up with more federal level investment and uh, a couple that you know I've heard you mention a couple in the state Tim with um, the training program or uh, I think you mentioned the forest business loan fund a, a little bit um, uh, Molly, you talked about the sustainability of supply or the importance of supply to folks in terms of of expanding up, so thinking about longer-term contract opportunities and things like that. Um, what else is out there that you're seeing right now that we could scale up to the federal level or even more within our western states? Am I looking oh, at you? Know, I, um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the Economic Development Administration, um, I think they're from the Department of Commerce, U.S. Department of Commerce, um, that is certainly a scalable um, agency. Um, Molly and I have met and discussed with the regional representatives here in Denver. Um, 
that's large scale assistance. The challenge is, I mean, they have so many programs and again, they are competitive. And so it's a challenge to educate ourselves so that we can then better educate our clients in the timber industry on where individually or programmatically we can be the best fit for some of those uh, federal programs. But they have an enormous footprint here in Colorado. Um, you know, I, I, we're scaling up our investment into our timber industry. Um, Colorado has, I believe, their 13 regional economic development districts or regions. Um, through our loan program, it's allowed us to bring the awareness of our timber industry. And in many cases, we're able to work with these economic development regions and they are putting direct financial investment to the tunes of millions of dollars into our timber industry across the state. Um, I'm currently discussing, and again, this was related to our workforce subcommittee. There's a these uh, economic development opportunity zones, one of which is particularly focused on bio economies. And so we're talking with them to select certain areas in Colorado for a, it's basically a risk analysis. And that risk analysis communicates to investment capital all across the nation, you know, where are good places to put their investment in terms of, uh, you know, um, bioeconomy facilities. Um, it's technology neutral. You know, they're not looking at establishing a particular technology or facility, but they're just trying to standardize, you know, kind of the ratings of these communities across the West. So investors don't have to do homework all themselves. They have a standardized platform they can look at. And so it's, it's something we're looking at for several communities in Colorado to have that risk analysis done. And one of the things it'll do is identify, um, you know, workforce, infrastructure, feedstock, and that analysis, I believe, will be helpful in identifying where some of the gaps are, um, if it is in workforce. Uh, an analysis like this will have a, a great value in bringing that attention to our, uh, continue to bring that to the higher levels of our economic development community, help us be more strategic where we focus some of these resources um, to kind of address these, uh, these uh, problems on a larger scale. Thanks. Other other programs, Julie, you have anything else that you think, like, hey, we should be doing this everywhere, or well, we need more <laughs> investment in this kind of a program? I've, I feel like I've heard so many ideas um, over just these last two days that I want to take back with me. Um, and I do think there are other industries that we can look to to think about additional programming. One example I can think of right now is um, something that's happening in Eastern Oregon are student-built homes at the high school level. And so these are career technical education programs for high school students where they're kind of solving a problem directly and uh, building the skill set and kind of funneling people into a, a career that, you know, is not a college-bound career. It's that role of home builders and contractors and all the subcontracting roles that we all desperately need in so many of our communities, you know, where we're facing workforce housing shortages and things like that. And um, so through those examples, you know, these are courses for the high school taught into our blocks where students are actually building a home over the course of a year that gets sold out in on the market to the community and those students then have an opportunity to see that career up close and see the value it has and, um, and that they can really make a good living doing this. So they're getting the skills, they're getting the experience, they're potentially moving into those careers. So, you know, it'd be fun to think about a model applied to the timber industry that would do that same thing. Which sounds like kind of the internship aspect that I think you were talking about right now in the state of Colorado, Molly, is maybe a, a similar kind of example of that, of bringing, bringing students in, or I don't know if it would be a whole cohort like that in the sense of, 
he, you know, we're going to do this timber sale together. <laughs> but um, that's a similar idea, I think. Well, and one thing um, Tim and I recognized early on is FFA actually does have a natural resources um, path, and FFA is Future Farmers of America. And so Tim and I trucked out to, I went to Sterling, Colorado this summer um, and attended the FFA career convention. And I'll be honest, we didn't compete well with um, cows. <laughs> but we did have a few kids um, show up in our segment. Um, well, between cows and tractors, um, farm tractors. Um, but we did get some students to come our way and learned more about a career in natural resources. And they had great questions. And so, and those are um, kids that, for the most part, enjoy being outside. Um, you know, they come from small rural communities. And, um, you know, hopefully we made an impression that, um, similar to ranching, being in forestry has that same stewardship value. And um, I think we'll continue to do that. And um, I met, I met some really good kids, and it, was, it gave me a little bit of hope that um, we can encourage a younger generation to follow in our footsteps, to be stewards of the land um, in, a, in a different way. So um, it was definitely a highlight of my summer. Okay. I think I've got to add one more example, and then I'm going to get some audience questions here, because I was just... Um, reviewing a conversation from last week um, with wood utilization folks um, and Damon Vaughn down at the Ecological Restoration Institute in Flagstaff was um, he was going back to the study about how many um, forest product workers what the workforce actually looks like and that there was like 170,000 people in the industry back in the 1950s and that's down to about 50,000 today but he said the productivity hadn't really gone down because this workforce had, uh, because the mechanization has increased and people have got more efficient with the work out on the landscapes and just kind of, you know, changed the nature of it. Um, and most of the people that we have today, and, and some we're rather proud of it, have been uh, in the industry for, they're aging in place, right, in the <laughs> industry. We're not necessarily, the you know, same thing we see across the board in agriculture, not just forest agriculture. Um, so bringing in that young, those young folks is, is really, really critical. So I appreciate you bringing that up. And this was all background for the, uh, the idea of developing a training, workforce training center uh, between the three states in the, in the Southwest here um, to start meeting the specific local needs. And I, I thought it was pretty impressive also that they said there's a lot of people who are just out there with a chainsaw. And a lot of that work still is chainsaw driven work and there's people who say, I want to do I want to do more, but I don't have the money for the equipment and I don't have the training to operate it. And so if we can give them that, I think we do have these entrepreneurs who are ready to move into that. And uh, and then the last the reason I think something like that might be replicable is we had folks from Oregon and um, Idaho and Arizona and Colorado on the call and um, everybody was saying like oh send me that stuff how are you developing the training center what did your study look like um, so just that that network connection that was happening was really great to see and see how that could expand uh, so do you have any questions off of the I guess virtual audience got anything coming in well I have question um, this is Lauren <laughs> with WGA um, so Molly you touched on the fact that Traditionally, we've pushed a lot of high school students, um, no matter where they are, to go to college. Um, and so a lot of the federal policies and programs uh, that we have in place to support students are still geared that way towards um, kind of emphasizing the four-year degree. So what, what kind of training and education do students need to be aware of to get into the careers that, that your businesses offer? Is it, should we be building more things like apprenticeships? I know you said that a lot of people do learning on the job and internships are maybe a more flexible option to do that. Um, or is it two-year 
schools or is it short-term certificates? And then what policies could be in place that would help build more of those pathways? That is a great question and I appreciate it. So through the RMRI workforce subcommittee, we've kind of explored all of those options. You know, in your traditional four-year degree in forestry, um, is great and we need foresters um, and, and there's a lot of two-year programs out there for foresters but to get people working in logging and manufacturing I'm not sure that's the best fit and so we we have to look at who is going to enjoy that work and who is interested in that work and how do we get them trained and so that's what kind of led us to the program in Maine and in California. And I'll be honest, um, I think capturing some of these people for a year is difficult. Um, a lot of folks can't afford to take a year off from work to get trained. And so I really like the Maine program, which is a 12-week program, um, and a lot of folks can do that. And it doesn't get them completely trained in every aspect of mechanized harvesting, but it gives them a really good foundation. And so I'd love to see something similar. Um, and, and we're exploring some of that with the community colleges here in Colorado, but it is expensive. That program in Maine has all of the equipment um, and they kind of start at the skit, you know, basic cutter and skitter and processor and and they, you know, a lot of focus on safety. And so I think those types of programs could be very successful. And it, honestly, it gets folks trained and back in the workforce because a year or two is hard. Um, real quick to add to Molly, there's a good example. There's a manufacturing training center in Colorado Springs. It's a for-profit model. Um, he uh, came to Colorado from Oregon State University with a wood products background, manufacturing. So this training center takes um, high school kids, brings them through, and it, the, the curriculum is based on secondary wood products manufacturing, cabinet making very value added manufacturing. He graduates these kids to positions all over the world. Europe is, you know, amazing with what they're doing with components and furniture and things like that. Um, we're trying to see if adding a primary manufacturing uh, curriculum to that existing facility that he has in terms of providing some skills and log breakdown. Um, some of the things that Molly has mentioned in operating equipment um, and working in a manufacturing environment um, on the primary side. So, um, and again, that, that facility is in the springs um, I had the opportunity to visit it pre-pandemic a couple of times. Um, the kids are impressive. They tend to be um, from, uh, you know, difficult backgrounds. Um, and yet, you know, through the, not only are they learning um, the technical skill set, but some of the social skill set to be successful in great careers. So um, that's an area that, uh, you know, we hope to uh, maybe engage a little bit more with this particular facility. And I would just add as a follow-up to those kind of programs, um, the need to invest in the capital infrastructure for those people who are going to become independent contractors mm -hmm. because, you know, some of the equipment might be a chainsaw, but other equipment is really expensive for them to go out and um, take on a big project. So that's a, bit, uh, a difficult thing, you know, for a young person to do to start their business. Anybody else here in the room have a question? Uh, my name is Kip Knutson. I work for uh, Alaska Governor Dunleavy. So I missed just the very beginning of the panel, but ha have any of you had any success with uh, recruiting veterans into the uh, into the industry? Um, specifically, I'm not aware. I'm sure that um, some has happened. Um, 
I think this manufacturing center in the Springs does take veterans uh, as well, um, just by my basic knowledge, but um, nothing deterministic that I've seen. It's been talked about and discussed, obviously, um, through the conservation corps and things of that nature. Um, we do have um, Fort Carson in Colorado Springs, um, and so we do have an individual from, an employee from the Pike San Isabel National Forest that um, his job is to kind of work with Fort Carson and, on some transition. And so he participates in our workforce development subcommittee and um, has been very interested in, you know, how do we help these veterans maybe start small businesses? And so we have started those conversations. They're not um, as far along as we would like, but a lot of veterans, they get out of, you know, they get out of the service and they, they want to work from themselves. And so trying to figure out how to bridge that gap and whether it's the Small Business Development Center of Colorado, helping them write a business plan. Um, but we definitely recognize that as a potential workforce and we've been inviting them into the conversations. Um, and I do know um, several of our businesses and our members do recognize and employ veterans. So, and here in Colorado, there's um, a veterans fire crew. Um, and so that's part of, um, not necessarily for us per se, but it gives them an opportunity to utilize um, skills they previously earned and learned and um, go to work for that as well. So, great question. Um, I don't have anything to add about that, but I think it's a, a really great um, population of people or demographic to keep in mind when we're um, creating these opportunities and making mm -hmm. sure that we're connecting and telling people about these opportunities. Hey, thanks. Uh, this is Nate Anderson from the U.S. Forest Service. Thanks for the panel. This is great to hear. Um, I, I just have a question about kind of the future of the industry. The workforce challenges that you've been describing in industry often translate to really severe pressure for automation. And we've seen this in high throughput sawmills. We've seen it in production agriculture, especially with the rise of semi-autonomous systems. Um, and probably not in the forest sector ready for fully autonomous systems, but it's coming. I mean, the semi-autonomous heads up technology driven approach to, to logging and forestry is, is coming. And I'm, I'm wondering if you could speak to that a little bit in terms of workforce development. At what point do we stop looking at finding employees who are willing to work in dangerous, risky, financially risky situations and starting to train people kind of for that industry 4.0 approach to forestry and what may be some of the costs and benefits of that or opportunities associated with automated forestry systems. So I'll take a, a stab at that. And I, you know, I, we were laughing this morning about the green chain, right? Um, and how um, it used to just really, if you lasted a, a week or two on the green chain, then you were made of tough stuff. Um, I started my career working at a sawmill in Española, New Mexico, and my, I worked in the office and my job was to do new hire paperwork. And the green chain was my nemesis, right? Because I would do all the paperwork. Um, we were a union mill and so I would do all that paperwork and they didn't come back the next day. Um, it was hard work. And what you have found is, well, one, we're in a global market for wood products. And so to be competitive, we've had to scale up su substantially to be competitive. And so a lot of our larger mills are completely automated. And it, one is just to get the production out, but two, it was a workforce issue, right? Pulling wood off the green chain sucked. <laughs> it's hard work. Um, and the same with the stacker and some of those. And so we've already seen that. Um, on the logging side, we've also seen that. You know, we used to be a chainsaw-driven um, workforce. And here in Colorado, we are predominantly mechanized equipment. I'm hopeful that, I don't know that we'll ever get completely automated on that side. Um, 
especially because we're seeing the federal land management agencies um, do things like D by P, designation by prescription. And so it'd be pretty hard to automate that process. Um, but we're, we have to gain efficiencies where we can, and so we have. Um, it, and you know, I have a member here in Colorado that would love to go to two shifts, and there's just simply not the workforce. When they, when they invested in that mill, that was the plan and it took a much, much longer to build up to a one shift workforce that the thought of going to two um, has just not panned out. Um, and so, and that's with a very, very automated mill. So, I don't know, what are your thoughts? I, I feel like um, these efficiencies really are the future and that they're important and they do solve one of the problems which is the number of people out there working, um, and and then the new problem becomes, where does this equipment come from? How do people start a business and invest and have it to be financially viable um, to purchase this technology, which is expensive? It's a big investment, and so how do we then solve that problem? Yeah, I, um, there's a tremendous pressure to lower labor um, inputs into our industry, um, not because of just the cost, but the difficulty of the work. So, yeah, they, we'll have to do that to make positions in our industry and in our forest products business community more attractive. Um, I think the um, training center um, that they're developing at NAU. Um, has that'll be a great step in the right direction because um, you know we talk about it Damon Vaughn used to work for our program and he's out there part of it um, um, they hired one of our foresters away to help head that up as well <laughs> so um no jealousy team there, efforts but, yes team but I, I you know we talk to him all the time and um, I believe they are building the capacity to do um, to investigate the automated the need for that um, just very simply through one of the things that again is we loan to the smaller businesses that may not be as automated one of the things they do recognize is if we help them purchase a piece of equipment they can offer safety to a greater degree and that's huge for these small businesses that you know you know accidents are very serious um, so that that's that's one of the unattended benefits um, that I think you're seeing through a little bit of our investment infrastructure in our small business community, um, you know, somewhat getting automated, getting their people off the ground in cabs, protected, safe. Yeah, and there's an awful lot of jobs in in the working lands that you can't automate, <laughs> and then that doesn't always go well. So thank you guys so much. This has really been a pleasure to hear all of your perspectives and the things that you're engaged with in workforce development. And I think that's all we've got for this panel. And then folks going to a break. I think, yeah, I think we are actually just going straight into our next round table. So let's give them okay. a round of applause and we'll get the next one set up.